in the beginning was matter, and matter begot the amoeba. The amoeba begot the worm. The worm begot the fish. The fish begot the amphibian. The amphibian begot the reptile. The reptile begot the lower mammal. The lower mammal begot the lemur. The lemur begot the monkey. The monkey begot the man who imagined God. This is the genealogy of man. That is almost a verbatim quote from a guy by the name of Charles Smith who puts in a nutshell for us the idea of atheism. Atheism is the idea that there is no God, that this world is a cosmic accident, that there's no mind behind it, that you are all random, chance, processed accidents that happen to be here with no creator behind your existence. It's an idea that's catching on. In fact, in the United States of America right now, they estimate that there are between 22 and 30 million people who say there is no God or I don't think there's enough evidence to prove there's not, there is one and so I'm going to act like there's not. Those people are called agnostics. They say that they don't have enough information to make a decision. So it's about 22 million to 30 million. If you were to take Columbus, Ohio and multiply it by 22 and fill it full with every single person in it, every person, 22 times. That's how many people in our nation say there's no God. Now, there's another idea. I'd say you're familiar with this one as well. It goes something like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God divided the light from the dark, and the light he called day, the dark he called night, and the evening, morning, day one, day two, God creates the firmament or the expanse, day three, the flowers, grass, and trees, day four, sun, moon, and stars, day five, birds and fish, day six, animals and humans, day seven, he stops his creative activity, gives us a pattern for the work week, and sums up everything he's done in seven days. You've probably heard that idea too. The idea that there's a God, a supernatural, all-powerful creator who can do something that no one else can do. He speaks things into existence. God is so powerful that when he says, let there be light, there is light. When he says, let there be an earth, there is an earth. That's the two ideas that we're trying to decide between this evening. The idea that there's no God and the idea that there is a God. Now, let me help you understand why this is so very important. It's because it's not academic. Now, here's what we mean by that. There's some stuff that you do that you think is just schoolwork, and it doesn't really matter whether you know how to do it or not. And so, yeah, it's fun to know how to do so you can make a good grade on a test, but in your life it won't make that big of a difference. You know, when I got into about 11th grade and I was doing some, some of that math that I have never now seen again, that was academic to me. Now, people who go and be engineers, it's not academic to them, but it's, it's one of those things that you think, will I ever use this? Let me tell you why this question is not academic. Let me tell you why it makes a huge difference. Because the way that you see yourself is how you then behave. Now, if you think you are an accident, if you think you're here and the way that you are put together is not purposeful, that you are here as some type of accident over millions of years with no purpose whatsoever, then that's going to come out in the way that you live. You're going to think, well, what's all this about? Well, why do I need to do my best? Well, why do I need to obey certain rules? Why do I need to be kind to others? If I want to do this, why don't I? Because everybody's just an accident, so why don't I do what I want? But if you think that you are designed intentionally, by the most powerful being ever conceived, and that you're not an accident. It's not that you are put together in the way that you are because of random chance processes, but because there's a loving creator who put you together exactly like you are because that's how he wanted you. Because the Bible says he knit your frame together, like he's creating a craft, like he's a craftsman, and he's putting you together in a way that he wants you to be. See, then you have a, a totally different outlook on your life. Then you walk with your head held high and you understand that you're valuable not because of how smart you are, not because of how fast you can run, but you're valuable because the greatest craftsman in the world put you together the way he wanted you to be together. Now, it makes a huge difference in how we live. And so ultimately, this question of is there a God or not, it's the most important question in anybody's life ever. And... 
How you come to understand this question is how you understand who you are and what you're here for. And so we need to look at this question. There are a lot of people who say that there is no God, and then there are an overwhelming number of people who say there is a God. Can we decide the truth on this matter? Well, what I want you to understand is that there is a truth. There is something that you can know about the situation. Let me explain to you what I mean. You guys know what truth is. If I were to say, I'm standing before you tonight and I'm talking to you, is that true? Yes. Now, it doesn't matter if you don't like that. It doesn't matter if you wish you were someone somewhere else. It doesn't matter if you'd rather someone else be up here. If I say, my name is Kyle, but I'm standing before you tonight and speaking to you, that's either true or false. It's either true that there's a God or it's false that there's a God. One of them is correct. And so, if I were to say, when I drop this phone, which way is it going to go? It's going to go down every single time because there's a law of gravity that says things accelerate toward the center of the earth at 9.8 meters per second squared. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It doesn't matter if you'd like it to be different. It doesn't matter if we all vote on it. Suppose that we all said, you know what? I've never liked gravity. Gravity is just so nerve-wracking. It's like, every time I get out of my bed, my foot goes down instead of floats. You know what I'd really like? When I get out of bed, instead of my foot falling toward the floor, if I could just float in the air and push myself off of my bed, wouldn't that be cool? Like if you rolled out of your bed, instead of going to the floor, you just said, Whew. you could like push yourself around your room, you go to your drawer, you give yourself like a little swim, shove, and you pull. Your... Wouldn't that be awesome? Hey, well, let's change it. Let's just all in here tonight vote to change the law of gravity. All those in favor of changing the law of gravity, let's vote. All right, let's say, well, all right, well, okay, well, let's say in theory, hypothetically, we all say, all right. And I say, that's not enough people. You know, the, the 600 people here tonight, that's just not going to be enough. We're going to need more people than that. I'm exaggerating slightly, but, you know, preachers count, whatever. Let's say we need more people. So right now there's about 7.4 billion people on the earth. So let's say we get 7 billion of them. Only about 400 million are out of the boat. We get 7 billion people and we all say, all right guys, you're tired of gravity as much as we are. Let's change it. All those in favor of changing gravity say aye. And 7 billion of them. Somehow we put a little all, uh, survey on the internet and we send it out to 7 billion people and we get 7 billion people to vote. Change the law of gravity. All those in favor, 7 billion say we want to change. Now, I say, whew, yes, we've just changed the law of gravity. Thank you, guys. I just need a volunteer to step off a 20-story building to prove that we've changed it. <laughs> Any takers? Now, hold on. We've got an overwhelming number of people who say, I want the law of gravity to be changed. Does that change the law of gravity? No, see, it doesn't matter how many people vote on it. It's not up for discussion. It's a law. It is a absolute, an absolute fact whether you like it or not. And you can know it. Every time you drop this phone, it's going to go down, whether you like it or not, whether you voted on it or not, whether you have a case on it or not, it's going down. Now, either there's a God or there's not a God, and we can decide that tonight and know it for a fact. And for the rest of our lives, we can know for a fact if there is one. And so, let's see how we would go about doing that. How can you decide if there is a mind involved in a process. Now that sounds technical, but, but it's not, really. How can you decide if there's a mind involved in a process? Well, let me show you how you can decide that. It's real easy. Suppose you go out into the woods and you look down on the ground of the woods and you see a rock. And right beside that rock, you see a cell phone. And I ask you, between this rock and this cell phone, do we know if one of these was created by a mind? Was intelligently put together? Can you know which one of those was intelligently put together? It's real easy, isn't it? In fact, you pick up the phone, you press the on button, it comes on, you start seeing programs and things that it runs. You've got Flappy Bird on there, or you've got Flappy Golf on there, or you've got the latest edition of Fortnite that you're playing on your phone, or you've got some other stuff on there. You've got Snap Tweeting and all kinds of other whatever it is, and man, you're on it. All right, and you can connect with people, and it processes information, and you can know that some intelligent mind was behind that phone. You know it for a fact. Now, suppose a person were to say to you, hey, 
I, I see that you've come to the conclusion that an intelligent mind was behind that phone, but not really. This is actually a product of blind chance processes over multiplied millions of years. Would you believe that? No, you don't believe that because there are things in this phone that are so well put together that there has to be intelligence behind it. That's a fact. Now, I'm going to show you how this works in your ideas about God. In 1976, the year I was born, there was a man by the name of Thomas B. Warren. He had a Ph.D. That's a terminal degree. You know what terminal means, a terminal degree? That means that's as high as you can go in that field of study. You can't go any higher. He had a Ph.D., a terminal degree in philosophy from Vanderbilt University, one of the most prestigious educational institutions in the United States of America. He was debating a guy by the name of Anthony Flew. In Denton, Texas, there were 5,000 people every single night for this four-night debate. So you're talking about 5,000 people, I mean, multiplying the group we've got by two, three, and boy, you'll get 5,000 people that we had every single night in Denton, Texas. Now, Anthony Flew was the, now listen to me, the world's leading atheist. Now, I'm not talking about the, the biggest unbeliever in one country. You know, we got the United States of America, there is United Kingdom, there's all kinds of other countries, etc. I'm not talking about one country, I'm talking about the world's leading atheist. He wrote a paper that he presented to the Socratic Society that C.S. Lewis was the chair of. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, and he is well known for putting together arguments to prove that there's a God. Anthony Flew delivered that paper. It is the most studied, most copied, most distributed atheistic philosophical paper in the world still today. He was the world's leading atheist. So they meet down in Denton, Texas for a four-night debate. And Anthony Flew uses the strongest, I'm going to say the strongest, maybe one of the strongest, arguments against Anthony Flew that there is. It's the argument from design. And here's all it says. When you see something that's designed, you know it had to have an intelligent designer. Now, it seems very simple. But it's the same principle that the Hebrews writer said when he said, every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. So you're driving down the road, you look over and you see a house. Who built that house? Oh, nobody built it. It was a, process, a product of blind random chance processes over hundreds or thousands or millions of years. Nobody thinks that. Because to put a house together, you have to have a foundation, then you have to have it framed, and you have to have electric stuff inside of it and then you have to have uh, insulation and all kinds of plumbing and there's all kinds of very important small aspects that have to go together to make the house work and when you see a house you don't say that happened accidentally by some unintelligent process you say well that's a great house a, a builder built that what do you mean by a builder an intelligent person who put the house together now, that's what the Bible says when it says every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God, talking about the design argument. So here's what Thomas B. Warren, the most educated defender of the faith at the time, used against Anthony Flew, the world's leading unbeliever. He put a picture of an artificial hand on the screen. Now, this was back when they didn't have stuff that they could put a, a video that is captivating of a little dog named Tucker who is looking at Alexa growling. That's, a, that's before all this. This is back in 76, right? All right, so puts a picture of it. It's a line-drawn hand. And he says to Dr. Flew, the person who doesn't believe in God, he said, does this hand have a designer? Now, it's a prosthetic. Now, a prosthetic hand is one that is an artificial hand. If you're in, a, in an accident, a car accident, or maybe an accident in the military or something like that, and you lose a limb, then they will put something on called a prosthesis or an artificial limb. If you lose a leg, they'll put an artificial leg, hand, etc. And this was a picture of a prosthetic hand. And he just asked a simple question, Dr. Flew, did this hand have a designer? 
What do you think Dr. Flew said to that question? Now, this was in 1976, a prosthetic limb. Uh, Forty years ago, prosthetic limbs weren't nearly as advanced as they are now. In fact, now prosthetic limbs are, well, they're remarkable feats of modern technology. In fact, what they can do is, several years ago, they've even come further than this from the time that I am talking about this particular one, but several years ago, I wrote an article about one. It was a $4 million artificial arm. Went from your shoulder all the way down. A 26-year-old Marine had lost her arm in a vehicle accident. And they took this $4 million, 10-pound metal alloy arm and connected it to her shoulder. Now, here's what's interesting about that. They could take the nerves out of her shoulder and hook them to wires in the motors of the fingers. And so when she thought about moving her pinky finger, well, they didn't connect them exactly right at first, if I understand it right. And so she would think about moving her pinky finger and the thumb of the prosthesis would move and then she had to get oriented to make sure that, okay, when she thought about moving her pinky finger, the pinky finger of the prosthetic limb actually moved. They took nerves out of her shoulder, hooked it to the wires of this artificial arm so that she could literally think about moving the fingers on the arm and it would work. And Dr. Kukin, the man involved in this process, he said, we've never seen anything like it. He said, she can now take a jar of spaghetti with one hand and with the other hand scrape out the remaining spaghetti sauce. Nobody has ever been able to do that with the artificial limbs up to this point. She said, they said, she can take a pair of pants and fold them using her two hands without using a flat surface. She can just use her hands and do it. Nobody has been able to do that with prosthetics up to this point. But, he said, but it's still very clumsy. Compared to what? Oh, just your hand. That $4 million metal alloy arm is still very clumsy compared to the most clumsy hand which is probably my left hand here. If you've ever seen me shoot a left-handed basketball shot, then you know that this left hand right here doesn't do real well when it comes to basketball. It's just pretty clumsy. Said that prosthetic limb is still clumsy compared to the human hand. So Dr. Warren puts the picture of the artificial limb on the screen, and he says to Dr. Flew, did this hand have a designer? What does Dr. Flew have to say? Did the artificial prosthetic limb have design? What do you have to say? Yes. Does a, does a, 10 million, does a $4 million, 10-pound metal alloy arm have a designer? Not only just one. It doesn't have a, one designer. It's got a team of brilliant designers, and they've spent literally tens of thousands of man hours trying to put together this arm that is the best that they can put together. Now, let's see if you take a hammer to the finger of a metal alloy arm. Bam! and smash that finger of a metal alloy arm, what happens? Smash it, it stays smashed. Let's say you take a knife to some of those wires that were connecting her nerves to the motors and you cut those, what happens? It stays cut until somebody smart comes and fixes it, right? It just doesn't fix itself. That'd be nice if cars fixed themselves, wouldn't it? Driving down the road, your alternator goes out like mine did the other day, boom! Something inside of it starts repairing it, alternator's done in 10 minutes, you're back on the road, that'd be great! Doesn't happen though, does it? Doesn't happen with prosthetic limbs, does it? Anthony Flew, the world's leading atheist, they asked him, Dr. Warren asked him, did this hand have designer? Flew said, yeah. You've got to say yeah. So then Thomas Warren puts up a picture of a human hand and asks the same question. Does this hand have a designer? Now, if you're going to be honest, there's a very straightforward, simple answer that you can know for a fact. If you're going to be dishonest, if for some reason you don't want to believe in God, you don't want to say it had a designer, well, you could answer like Flew did. And I'll tell you how he answered in just a minute, but let's go back to our illustration. You take a hammer and you accidentally smash the finger of this hand. I mean, being as clumsy as I am, let's say I'm using my hammer in my left hand, obviously it doesn't even look like a hammer with my left because I don't because it's real clumsy. And whack! I smash my pointer finger on my right hand. What happens 
when I smash my pointer finger. If I wait six weeks, will my pointer finger bone still be broken? No, did you know there are enzymes in your body right now that eat bone? Did you know that? Don't you hope they don't go crazy? One morning you wake up and those enzymes just got out of control and there's no bone left in your right arm. Oh, my enzymes got loose last night. I ate all my bone. Crazy enzymes. There's an enzyme in your body that if you take a hammer and you smash the finger of your right hand and it's in little bone chips, those enzymes go and they start eating those little bone chips. But your body is so well designed and programmed that it doesn't eat bone that's going to be usable again. So only bone chips that are far enough away from the break does it start to eat. The bone chips that are close enough to be used again, it starts putting those together and starts rebuilding those with calcium and bone material. So you come back in six weeks. Sometimes your finger might be a little crooked. If you were to look at my left thumb compared to my right, that one's a little crooked because I broke it when I was in sixth grade. But you know what? My left thumb's been working great for the last, oh, oh you're looking at 30-something years. Works great. I broke it one time and it fixed itself. I didn't have to do anything. I just slept. Woke up, slept, woke up, slept, woke up, fix it. In fact, lots of times, when you break your finger, it's stronger where you broke it than it was before you broke it. Would you like to have a hand that fixes itself or one that if you break it, you got to get somebody else to fix it? Yeah, that's a pretty simple question. Now, let's say you accidentally cut some of the wires of your hand. Let's say you accidentally take a knife and you cut your arm and it starts to bleed. But immediately your body tells itself, oh, hey, my arm's bleeding. And so it, so it starts sending a cascade of chemicals and enzymes that makes your blood clot. Isn't that exciting? It stops you from bleeding. But think about that. Your blood just starts making little balls of clotty blood. What happens if that decides, if your body decides, oh, I want to do that close to my heart or I want to do that in the middle of one of my arteries, etc.? Well, you have a blood clot and you have a real problem. Your body is so well designed that it tells your blood to clot only in the place you were just cut. And then it starts repairing and regrowing those arteries, veins, capillaries, etc. that were cut. Now, you got a fake hand and a real hand. The fake hand was designed by brilliant people over tens of thousands of hours. It costs $40 million just for this one. It's made out of a lightweight metal alloy that is the top of human knowledge. Then you got a clumsy cow but left hand that can't shoot a basketball worth anything, and that if I were to use a hammer with my left hand, my right hand would suffer. Now, which one you want? You know exactly which one you want. Because the prosthetic limb, the prosthetic limb, however good it is, isn't near as good as a regular human hand. And so Thomas Warren asked Dr. Flew, he said, did this hand, the regular human hand, the biological human hand attached to your shoulder, did it have a designer? If you're honest, there's only one way to answer this question. The same way you answered the first one. Did the artificial limb have a designer? Yes. Does the human limb have a designer? Yes. Who is it? For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is, is God. And the flu said, no, it didn't have a designer. Thomas Warren said, how'd it get there? Here was Flew's answer. He's the world's leading atheist at the time in 1976. Here's his answer. It just grew there. Let's see how that would work. I come into my math class. I'm not supposed to be using a calculator. The teacher passes out the test. There's a calculator on my desk. She walks up and says, Kyle, you're not supposed to be using a calculator. Where'd that come from? It just grew there. Would that work? It just grew there? That calculator is a piece of, of computing machinery that doesn't just grow out of the dirt on your desk. It just grew there? you got a hand that makes the leading prosthetic limb in the world that costs $4 million look clumsy. I mean, I'm not even talking clumsy. I'm talking about clumsy. And your answer from the world's leading atheist, the highest scholarly level of unbelief in the world... Is it just grew there? See, we've got a problem there. That's just dishonest. You can know for a fact that if, a prosthet and a, if an artificial hand has a designer and your hand is better, what do you know about your hand? It had an intelligent designer. Now, here's what's interesting. Anthony Flew said that in 1976. 
in 2006, he came out with a book, and the title of that book was There Is No God. Except the no was marked out. And the real title was There Is A God. And the subtitle was How the World's Leading Atheist Became a Believer. Now, for 30 years after he debated Thomas Warren in Denton, Texas, he wrote a book in his 80s. He was 80 years old. Actually, I think he was 82 at the time he wrote this. He said, I have looked at the design in the human body, and it is so perfectly put together. There is no possible way, no possible way, none whatsoever, that it could be the product of accidental processes over millions of years. Whenever we see this kind of design, we always say there's an intelligent designer. You have to say that about the human body. You can look at the human body and know there is a God. See, the fact of the matter is, you are here because God designed you. He made you. You are the pinnacle of God's creation. He spoke life into existence and he breathed into Adam the breath of life and he designed every single one of you intentionally exactly how he wanted you. And you're not the product of some mindless random chance processes over multiplied millions of years. There's an all-powerful creator God who said, I want you to be created. Kyle Butt. And each one of you individually, God knit together perfectly. And that's why the psalmist said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And that my soul knows very, very well. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the most scientific statement that's ever been uttered and will be true till the end of time. You have been such a wonderful listening audience. I can't wait to be with you for the rest of the weekend. I'm excited that you are here and I hope that you enjoy this kind of thing as much as I did growing up. It was just so fun to me to get together with other Christians, to see adults who cared enough to organize it and get all the food and everything and and college kids who cared enough to come back from college and be a part of it. And I hope that you'll take it all in Understand it for what it is, and that's a a great opportunity for you to get closer to your Creator and a great opportunity for you to get closer to other people who love that Creator and want you to do the very best you can in your spiritual life. Thank you for letting me be here.